Thanks for joining us at the Business Growth Cafe, where each week we select from a menu of topics for a focused discussion with an industry expert to provide insights that can impact your business's growth with your host, Angelo Ponzi. Hi, I'm Angelo Ponzi, your host here at the Business Growth Cafe, and thank you for joining us. Today at the cafe, I'm excited to welcome back Don Reese, CEO of The Wooden Floor, and Marcelo Rios, CEO of Human Options, to discuss the business of building and running a nonprofit. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you were both back here in uh, mid-February, I believe, and looking down at my notes. Mm -hmm. uh, we had an incredible conversation. So first of all, if you're tuning in, we want you to go back to the February show, listen to that. This is If we're going to count that as part one, this will be part two, and we're going to do a part three. So this is going to be very exciting. You're going to get lots of information and learn how to have a successful nonprofit. I'm making that promise. We're going to deliver today, okay? <laughs> yes, we yes. will. All right. So before we get started, though, let's for those newcomers, let's put it in perspective and let's give me a little overview of who you are and uh, what your nonprofit is about. And, Don, I'll go with you first. Okay, great. Thank you, Angelo. Um, so... The Wooden Floor is a creative youth development organization. Right now we're headquartered in Santa Ana. We have two locations and we serve 475 children year round from two locations now. Uh, our goal is to use dance education combined with academic tutoring, college career readiness, and social services in order to support children over a 10 year journey from third grade all the way through high school. And really at the end, our end goal is to, to, to transform more young people in low income communities through the power of dance and that access to higher education. And we know that it works because this year is our 15th year in a row that 100% of our students have um, graduated high school and immediately enrolled in higher education. And so now that we're taking this model also nationally, we have our first licensed partner in Washington, D.C. And um, we're hoping that we'll have future partners in the in the near future. Um, but today it's all about growth in Orange County. And since we last met, um, we've now identified our third location also in Santa oh, Ana. And uh, hoping that we'd be able to bring on more children, at least 100 more children um, by 2021. Uh, sec and so about myself is I started uh, in the for-profit sector in management consulting in the high technology uh, sector um, working with software companies and helping them develop strategy, um, HR services, finance services, and business development. And I was very fortunate that my first um, boss and, and mentor um, really encouraged me to give back into the community. So I also worked in um, some boards when I was only in my 20s in arts, education, and um, human services boards. And so fast forward um, today, I'm at the wooden floor and I'm in arts, education, <laughs> and human services. And our goal today is really to move young people forward. Oh, fantastic. And I was just going to add that I'm also now also on the board of 1OC. Oh, and fair. I'm also the chair of the Nonprofit Advisory Council. And I'm also on the board of Orange County Music and Dance, and then I've just joined the Santa Ana Chamber as well. And you sleep when? <laughs> wow. Sleep I thought I was busy. Yeah, I, I, but I, it's, it's all in part of, you know, um, kind of tying to some questions we're going to talk about later about how we really build the brand of the wooden floor in the community, and the number one way we do it is through our own leadership footprint. Okay, fantastic. Marcella? Sure. Human Options ignites social change by educating Orange County to recognize relationship violence as something that threatens everybody. Um, we advocate for those that are affected by abuse and extend a safe place for victims while empowering survivors um, on their path of healing. And so we actually run a, a sort of full comprehensive array of services. We prevent violence and relationship violence through education in the schools by making sure that there is someone as a first responder to recognize relationship violence early on and to intervene and get that person on a path to healing. We also do much more um, protection, which is more in our residential settings, where we are doing emergency shelter, transitional housing, and really invested in ending homelessness for victims of domestic violence. We also empower, and a lot of that is done through educational components, making sure that um, women and children and men that are being affected by relationship violence know um, their rights, know the access of um, how they can access the legal system to get protections that they might need, how to um, access different types of services, and then really empower them to go out and live their full potential in the community. 
Um, we have been in Orange County for over 38 years, which is extremely exciting, and are currently launching and hoping to impact networks in addition to communities. And that is done through partnerships. Um, we've been educating healthcare practitioners over the years to recognize relationship violence. We've been um, educating beauticians as well, and beauticians oh, okay. have been extremely helpful. So really reaching out into the community itself and helping raise awareness for people to pay attention to what's going on. Absolutely, and it's it's really something where we've noted that um, somebody has told their story multiple times and never really gotten um, the response or the assistance that they've needed. And what that does is that essentially feeds into somebody's, what they've been hearing from their abuser years, for years, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to care. Nobody's ever going to help you. And so what we do is try and break that by helping making sure that when somebody's sharing their story that they know that they're being listened to, that it's not okay, and they get connected to assistance. Okay. I think you used the phrase before prevention and intervention is kind of the two two lanes mm -hmm. you take. Mm -hmm. So, But you didn't mention about yourself. Yes. So, you're the CEO. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Let's I talk am. about your rise. Um, the emerging of emerging. you guys as <laughs> we talked in the hallway. Um, sure. I am, I, uh, for the last three years, I've been the CEO at Human Options. And prior to that, I was the CEO at Human Options. And I'd been there for 10 years. And I worked alongside our founding executive director for that time and really helped get us on a path to expanding our footprint in Orange County. Um, on that journey, I was um, on the board of directors for the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence and eventually became their board president, where I really got a big feel for what was happening on the, on the statewide landscape and the national landscape in our field. Um, I am currently on the Family Violence Appellate Project Board of Directors as well as the Continuum of Care Governing Board. Um, and then I sit on a task force at WNOC, which is on board diversity. Yeah, we okay. both do. And so you're also very busy. Um, <laughs> you know, time for you. <laughs> yeah, well, I appreciate that. It's, uh, you know, I, I, I had to say it was Friday afternoon and there were drinks. I just didn't tell you it was water and coffee. I know, darn it. <laughs> so I, I'm going to start off with you, Marcella. Mm -hmm. and, and you guys have very successful and some longevity. You said 38 years, Don, you said 36. 36 years. I mean, that's that's longer than a lot of businesses manage right. to survive. And you guys have been part of that and growing that and really brought a lot of sophistication to it. We're going to talk about a lot of that. But let's take it up 30,000 feet and think about nonprofits in general. And we'll, we can pick on Orange County, but in, in general, what are the biggest challenges that most nonprofits face as they're really trying to grow and, frankly, survive? Yeah, you know, I, when I was thinking about that question, I was thinking there's there are two things. One is, as a nonprofit sector, our work is really intended to change the community and to change the landscape in Orange County, and you don't do that alone. And so as a nonprofit, you're expected to, and you should, work with other nonprofits. And so we've actually kind of coined it as cooperation, right? So okay. it's really hard to both cooperate with another nonprofit and still be like, well, I am brag about yourself at the same time. It, they almost, there's some tension between bragging about yourself as a, we're a great brand, we've got a solid program, we've got solid outcomes, and still feeling like you can partner with others who are doing like work. Um, and so as I think that is one of the things is really learning how to uniquely sell yourself, uniquely position yourself, and talk about the great work that you do in service of others while being cooperative and knowing that we share space and there's intersectionality between a lot of our work and that really you can't negate the work of another organization in order to lift yourself up. So that, that that's one thing that came to mind for me as something that okay. keeps people from growing and thriving because you're not pushing your brand out enough if you feel like, well, I can't really brag about myself because that's not really what nonprofits do. So I think you have to get comfortable with bragging about the good work because you're doing it in service of someone. And the other thing that came up to mind for me is that in the nonprofit sector is we are reacting to things. We're responding to needs. And so that really sometimes takes away from the idea of really innovating and creating space to create, to innovate. And innovate could be, you know, you're, you're maybe, I think in some ways, um, caught up by certain funding streams. We can only do this or they expect us to do it this way. And there has to be really room to think about bigger ideas mm -hmm. and think about how would we do this differently? How do we adapt to the changing times? How do we listen to the people that we're serving? Because everything is changing around us and we can't do things the same way that we have in the past. And without really spending time reflection, reflecting and creating that um, culture of learning within the organization. So knowing that people coming in may see it a different way and actually asking and expecting, tell me how else we could be doing this, right? And then accepting that feedback and integrating it. 
um, we get stuck in the way that we've always done it, which is, which essentially then you're not growing if you're not learning from others. Right. We, we talk a lot of times about working on your business versus in your business, mm -hmm. and I think that's very reflective of what you said. If we get so wrapped up in that day-to-day -day and the nuances and chasing you know, those crises and activities that keep popping up, we don't spend time to really work on it. Um, I, I did some uh, survey work here in Orange County with some CEOs, and one of the questions we ask is, you know, how much time do you spend working on your business every month? And it really broke down to about an average of one hour a day. For me, I don't know, that doesn't seem like a whole lot of time to really be effective, especially when uh, the other statistic that I quote is 90% of executives say that it's not the planning, it's the implementation that their strategic plans fail. Right. So really, it's it's what you said is really important that these nonprofits spend the time and not get caught up in the nuances every day, but really to step back and look. I, I Somebody told me one time is, you know, we talked about, you know, getting outside the box. Mm -hmm. He says, you need to get outside the box, walk around the box and, you know, take it, <laughs> you know, get the heck away. I had a friend that said one time, I wish I was in the box. Like she's always outside the box. <laughs> I just clo just close the lid for a little while so I can she hang said, out in the box. Well, I wish I could. You know, in the nonprofit sector, I think that's what it is. We're always, you know, driving if you're dr a driver. You sure, know? sure. Well, let's talk about 30,000 feet for you. I think I'm um, listening. I would agree with everything with um, Maricela said. I think for myself is that I look at nonprofits in different um, spectrums. Mm -hmm. So I think there's the emerging nonprofit. There's the... Um, the more established nonprofit, um, medium size, you know, or small to medium size, and then there's um, those who have had longer term longevity. And even in longer term longevity doesn't mean they're always thriving and surviving. You know, they're in, they could be in those modes too. Mm -hmm. And so I think the the main kind of through line through that is that you have to have a strategic long term vision for your work and what your impact of your work is going to do. And even if you're a small nonprofit and you're just kind of getting your um, feet on the ground, you still have to have a bold vision for what you want to accomplish with whatever that is for yourself. Um, I have, was just talking about um, a good friend that runs a, a nonprofit that is um, emerging, and but she has a bold vision. She's already on the national level, and but her budget's fairly nominal, and but she's making it happen. And then there's other that are sometimes larger and lumbering, you know, that they're mm -hmm. not learners and, act and innovators. And so when I kind of look at this, it's like some nonprofits sometimes will kind of act small with a scarcity mindset. And I no matter where you are in that spectrum, you have to have a big, bold vision for what you want to accomplish. Because I believe that will then set other people around you to be super excited. So if um, the wooden floor was doing what it did 36 years ago, it was fantastic. And now we're doing all these great things today and if we weren't continually innovating and, and reviewing and making sure that we're staying relevant to the community need um, we would also find that same kind of life cycle that businesses go through sure sure if you think about in, in talking about the, the vision and having that vision where, where smaller nonprofits really struggle and fail I mean is that is that it they just they have an idea they have a, a mission they start it but they're not real leaders are not business people they you know they just think that that you know build it and they will come so to speak yeah. right so what's that mentality that gets somebody going and then just never really takes off because they just don't have those skills you know I, it's, it's interesting because I, I agree with what you're saying Don in terms of the vision and, and I think that that the, if you really pause and think about vision that that's generally um, if you stop if you focus too much on mission and tactics and you, you lose sight of vision, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but if you're really holding that vision, it moves a little bit quicker. What I think mm -hmm. happens in smaller nonprofits um, and, and medium-sized nonprofits yeah. quite often as well is that when you get so tied down to like what's happening right in front of you in that moment and the and the day-to-day -day, um, challenges and, and in, not, in smaller nonprofits, you've got one person doing four people's jobs, right? And so when right. you're doing that, I mean, you, you know, we joked about like whether Don sleeps or not, and I'm sure she does maybe five minutes a night. <laughs> but I think, um, but when you're so focused on, on um, the day-to-day -day minutia, it's really hard to remember what you set out to do, right? I, I, mm -hmm. um, I heard a, a analogy one time, it's like when you, when you're knee knee deep in alligators, it's hard to remember that your objective was to drain the swamp, right? I mean, yeah. that's that. I think that's that's kind of it. Is that when you're when you're smaller, you take on so much, you do things all the time, and so 
Um, but vision, if you hold vision and you're really looking mm -hmm. at that, then you're making strategic decisions about how you invest your time and energy. And that's one of the things that even at our size is we, we struggle, right? A periodic, periodically, we're not making strategic decisions about the investment in time and energy and resources. But we've, we're getting better at it. We're practicing. Yes. How do we make decisions about whether this is something that actually will help advance our mission and our vision? And then really talking about how we're making those decisions so that when people come and bring something, they bring it with that in mind. They bring it knowing that the way they're going to make a decision is through a decision, a decision screen that mm -hmm. re directly reflects our values and the strategic objectives. But that means everybody has to know that. And when you're smaller, it's a little bit more difficult to say that, to do that. Sure. The, you know, one of the, I'm going to flip this a little bit in kind of a customer first strategy. I talk a lot about this when I'm, when I'm giving presentations. And so many times I talk to organizations, they think about the products and services that they sell and I'm great and we're wonderful and you're going to be lucky if you buy our stuff. But they don't really take the consumer, if you will, or the customer in mind mm -hmm. when they're developing those strategies and those messaging points. When, when you guys are talking to in doing making those decisions you were just talking about I mean do you have your your target your customer it's not the right word but you know your recipient in mind when you make these strategic decisions or is it really backing off and thinking about the organization versus if I make this decision this is going to how it impact yeah, uh, for for us, for human options, we de we most definitely do. What we do is we, at the end of every service delivery, so if they are in our residential program or another service, we survey them and, and try and get a sense of, was this effective? Did this work? Um, so we do it in that manner. And then the other is actually really asking them what they need. So we actually have groups where we sit down and ask, like, what, what is it we need? Are we meeting the needs? And really design our interventions based on that. It's so critical because we can have all the support in the world, but if you don't have people accessing your services, you're not very successful, right? So right. there's two different audiences that we're looking at. One is um, those that we're in service of and then those who are supporting the service that we're giving. So we can have a ton of support on one end or the other end, but we really have to marry both of them to be successful as an organization. Okay, how about you, Doc? Uh, one of our guiding principles is we're student-centered in, in all of our decision making. And so that's our number one mm -hmm. right at the top, board, staff, um, families get all are on board on making sure that all of our decisions are student-centered so if, if we got some maybe some, someone come in and pitched us an idea on a, an adult program to implement we're like I'm sorry that's we do we do provide those services through the intervention through the child um, mm -hmm. but we don't just do these tangentials and so one of we, one of the things we're really known for is being very focused and because we also have a decision made um, filter as well that um, I think I agree with what Marcella said when you're smaller um, it's difficult because you just have all these things kind of coming at you all the time but when you get to be at a place where you can establish it we actually start at mission first um, then we look at partnership relationships or what are the impact mm -hmm. to the organization then we look at financial implications we also factor in staffing and timing mm -hmm. making sure we're not you know tsunami or our, our staff and then really we take it down to a yes no maybe and um, the yeses are the ones we pursue. The noes are definitive. We know why we're not pursuing it too early, not, not fully grown. And then the maybes are ones that look interesting that we'll take to the board and I'll say, hey, this looks like a new opportunity to maybe scale somewhere nationally in another location. But we just don't, we're very focused on knowing what we do and why we do it. And so people now know they have to come to us 18 to 24 months in advance in order to pitch a new project to us because we already have our plans in place and our strategies and what we're trying to accomplish. Sure. Um, you know, so I listening to all this, of course, I feel very fortunate and, and the audience won't know this and Maricela might not even know this, but I actually have a pilot program right. with you coming up right. in, a, in a month. Mm -hmm. I and think you we, went through our filter. And we did. It started about <laughs> six or seven or eight months yes. ago. So, uh, But we're really excited about that. Right. And, and certainly it is it is student focused and, and I won't sidetrack us with that conversation. But I can but just maybe add to it is that we took that, that opportunity through the filter. Um, then we um, we now really do a lot of piloting and before mm -hmm. as part of innovation is the innovation cycle for us and so what we're doing with this opportunity is making sure that it works for a majority of a student taking mm -hmm. a subset of them and if it does we're gonna scale it up right. you know and and then we can go to our funders and our supporters and say look this is what we're trying to accomplish for the students okay yeah. so we're midway I think but 
two suggestions if you could give to the listeners about how they can help improve running their business of a nonprofit and I'll go back to you I would this is, um, so I would say that you have to focus on yourself as a nonprofit leader I would say that's the number one thing I know that sounds probably contrary to what you would expect me to say but if you're not fulfilling your gas tank about it, the nonprofit sector is is very challenging like all business but um, because we also have an emotional connection to our families mm -hmm. we have a, we put a lot of output in order to make sure more people know about what we're doing in the community um, you have to invest in yourself through leadership development reading um, really focusing on making sure that you're always thinking ahead Ahead of where the the ball's going so you can make sure that you can make sure there's no landmines or anything sure. that you're about to hit and um, like Marcella said too earlier is that you're you can be very easy to get stuck in the weeds and as a leader of a nonprofit the number one thing you can do is just invest in yourself as a learner and a listener and just continue to probe and ask the right questions um, from the business context of a nonprofit is that really you have to get your house in order financially um, I was a CFO before a CEO and so I see both sides of the equation. I unfortunately had to take a nonprofit into bankruptcy a few years mm. ago, and um, that's not a pretty uh, opportunity. Um, I was the last person kept on from the board. And, um, and what it really taught me was that you have to put in really strong, um, not, not um, uh, we call them pillars of um, financial um, strength, mm. and it's around your annual fund, your budgeting, mm -hmm. your um, planned giving, and your endowment. And if you look at your diversification of revenue, even from day one of saying, just like we do with kids or ourselves, make sure you're saving for tomorrow, starting your rainy day fund, starting a reserve, operating reserve. Um, today, Weingart Foundation is a foundation up in LA. And even after this post-recession, they've been encouraging and even giving grant dollars to help nonprofits um, form reserves. And most nonprofits today don't have reserves over two to three months but if you start with that as your as your very beginning of your nonprofit all the way to the larger nonprofits make sure because you want to be there for your clients you want to be there for who you're serving because they are in so much dire situation that if you start to stumble they'll really feel it yeah, more than you and so you have to have that um, mindset around financial sustainability well that's a, that's great advice I mean so many times we I did a show at talking to a CFO and my premise was that most small businesses and I'll include nonprofits don't really understand their financials and how to mm -hmm. read them and really how to plan and budget and do that allocation and I think that's great you know like we deal with our families right you want to save six months or whatever it happens right. to be because if something were to happen yeah. you want to have those reserves how about you yeah I mean what I'd add to that is you also I mean you have to know the cost of business right you have to co know the cost of running your nonprofit in order to know how much revenue is going to be generated to to fulfill your mission so I mean I, I think that's really important the other things that come to mind and, and we talked about this a little bit before we went on air is the culture and really thinking about the culture within the organization because mm -hmm. ultimately culture eats strategy for breakfast right so if you don't have a good culture and a strong a strong culture that's helping drive your strategy then that culture is derailing your strategy and that takes a lot more time to to fix so you really have to focus on the type of culture and values that you want to have as an organization and spend time doing that um, and then the other thing that that I, Don and I had an opportunity to talk about recently was really thinking about you have to have that big vision, that big, bold vision that, that we mentioned earlier, and then also op operate small. So you can't really be yep. like, oh, I'm this big organization. You still have to act like a small business mm -hmm. and really mind those, those the what you have in terms of resources and all of those different things before you get too big. You can't scale too fast. So you have to really think about, you know, we want that we have this big audacious goal and this vision that we're going to change the world, but you can't do it, but you don't have to do it in this large scale all, all at once. Yeah. And, and it can be over time. I mean, right. that's a Jim Collins, right? The big, hairy, audacious goal right. yeah. isn't about having something happen in a, a year or two. It's, no. it's, you know your ultimate goal that you'd like to achieve and I was going to add is Mike Misselm spoke at the grantee reception mm -hmm. and he talked about that even as big as I you know Edwards Life Sciences worldwide now 12,000 people <laughs> I have lots of friends that work there is that Mike said at the at our is that they still act small and you just you have to be humble you have mm -hmm. to act small um, because um, you know it, it's just really important that you just don't as my one donor that I love um, says, you, you can't get too big for your bridges. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And I, ha I have his note on my bulletin board. <laughs> um, and um, and it, it's true, you know, that you just have to make sure you stay humble. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, I think I got time for one more question before the part two of this or this episode ends. We talked last time about active boards and the importance of boards, but through some observations that I've, I've recently have, I can see, you know, some of these smaller nonprofits and all the things we've been discussing, but their boards are volunteers. And in my experience, that some of them showed, some of them didn't show, some of them didn't do what they were supposed to do. So what's some advice you can give about managing, you know, uh, volunteer boards or maybe they need to get away from volunteer boards and get <laughs> some active and, and solid boards? Yeah. I, I, but um, in my experience, is I've, I've had a pretty positive experience because I entered into it thinking it's a partnership. I'm not managing them, but I'm actually partnering with them okay. for the benefit of the organization. And that's been really clear from the very beginning as we, we both approach it as learners. But uh, my board president, myself, and my chairs, uh, the chairs of my various committees, and, and myself spend time really developing a relationship because it's all about relationships and really understanding where do we want to go with the organization and what is it going to take from each one of us to do that. Um, because that, that's what it requires. We both have to be equally invested in the success of the organization. Okay. Dawn? Um, I'd say the same. Also, I think, um, you know, your board members are there for um, passion and purpose, mm -hmm. right? They're there for a reason <laughs> most of the time. And so one of the things that you need to do is hone in on that individual. You can't look at the board as a, as a group. You have to still look at them as that individual board member supporter um, in order to help you um, connect with where their heart is. Um, and um, for our model as an example, um, we're arts, education, health and human services, higher ed. And so our board members can, they have to obviously ad love and adopt the whole mission, but they can find the place Places that they have a passion and purpose. So maybe it's about scholarship support or it's around education, higher ed. Great, then bring all your friends to our next yeah. event we have <laughs> coming up. But someone else might, might love our art, um, our concert and then bring all their friends to that. So you know what I mean? It's like we really try mm -hmm. to hone into that individual supporter. But at the end of the day, um, I always give, because um, I have a lot of people come to me who know my story about being in the for-profit sector before the nonprofit sector. And they ask, you know, I'm looking to make this transition. And I, my number one thing says, are, you know, are you a consensus builder? The mm, number one mm -hmm. thing you need at a board level is consensus and someone that you can help share. Even though I'm the CEO of the Wooden Floor, I have a board of directors I report into um, for a lot of the major decisions. I still will go to them. Um, luckily, we have such a great partnership. We partner together. But um, you have to be a consensus and be okay with that, that I'm okay that if that, that decision may be isn't the right one for the organization. I'm hoping we're on it together, but I have to. I have to make sure that um, that I respect that and their role as a board member. But then we also have expectations of them. Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Well, I we are out of time for this episode. So, um, so uh, Don, why don't you tell the listeners how they can contact you and reach you? Uh, Don Reese um, at LinkedIn. Uh, Don S. Rees, Twitter, Don S. Rees, and our website is thewoodenfloor.org. Okay, Marcella? M. Rios at humanoptions.org. Our website is uh, humanoptions.org, and I'm on LinkedIn as well. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for joining us at the cafe. You can find out more about me and read my blogs and view my show videos at theponzigroup.com or connect with me on LinkedIn as well. And you can subscribe to the show at thebusinessgrowthcafe.com. We're now on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spreaker, and others around the world. Join me next episode with these ladies at the Business Growth Cafe. Thank you for listening to today's discussion at the Business Growth Cafe with your host, Angelo Ponzi. Take a moment to subscribe to this podcast and visit our website at www.businessgrowthcafe.com. Read Angelo Ponzi's blogs at www.theponzigroup.com.